Hi. Um, so today I want to continue our study of Derrida's uh, book Rogues by looking at uh, section 8 of that first essay, The Reason of the Strongest. Um, section 8, uh, I want to focus on section 8 as I earlier focused on section 3 because those two sections of the essay, it seems to me, are the most uh, technical, the ones where he most uh, precise, most clearly and precisely is focusing on, uh, you know, a sort of philosophical concept or something like that and, and working through its implications. Chapter 3 um, was mostly about the paradoxes uh, uh, integral or internal to the notion of democracy, and especially this the theme of autoimmunity, which sort of comes out of comes out of all of them really, but it's one of the, you know one of the things he really focused on. Um, but so that's the big theme behind chapter three, which we talked about before. And now uh, chapter eight is really going to focus on an expression he uses, which is democracy to come. Uh, now what is that? So you you know I can use the English expression paradoxes of democracy. You know what I'm talking about. Whereas if I just said autoimmunity, you wouldn't immediately know what that means, but presumably you do because you work through that chapter. Well, similarly here, democracy to come by itself. Um, you don't automatically know what that means. That's his word. In regular English, how would we talk about, how would, how would I say what that's about? Well, roughly, I would say it's about what the ideal of democracy is. You know, right? In other words, what democracy is, is striving for. Um, and so, you know, some, somebody could look around and say, they could say, yeah, you know, we're trying to do democracy. If we got it, or, you know, they might say, what, what is the future of democracy? Or what will democracy be in the future? Uh, uh, or um, what is the democracy that is coming? What is yet? What is the democracy that is yet to come? Right. If you think about those kinds of expressions, you know ways people could speak in English, then I think you get a sense of uh, what is conjured up by that notion of democracy to come, and how that relates to what, in general, we might call kind of the uh, the ideal of democracy. What uh, what democracy is sort of aiming at. Um, uh, as I said, that's that's um, kind of talking in loose English. The, the, the reason I stress that is because I've used this word ideal a significant part of this chapter, and the thing I'm going to be central to what I'm talking about today is Derrida's uh, reflections on you know the the ways that notion of ideal does and doesn't fit to this. So uh, to this thing he's trying to talk about. So. All the, so what I'm trying to underline here is just that, uh, though I've used that word to sort of clue you in to what the basic topic is that we're talking about, I also want you to recognize that that language, um, while maybe it's okay as a preliminary entry, is not itself um, unambiguously good. And so we're going to go on to talk about that. Anyway. That's going to be what our topic is today. Well, that's the topic of this chapter, largely. Um, uh, uh, as with chapter three, so here with chapter eight, I want to uh, emphasize again the structure of the chapter, because it's crucial when you're trying to read something like this that you're clear on, you know, what you're reading about at any given point. So I'm going to quickly talk through the the structure of Derrida's uh, chapter. I keep calling it a chapter. I guess it's a section. But I'm going to quickly talk through the structure this chapter or section takes. Um, and then the first thing I want to do is really just talk about one segment of that. But okay, but what is the what is the structure of the chapter? Well, he begins uh, with a couple of introductory pages, uh, just talking about uh, a little bit more about the, the 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 grammatical and semantical use of the French term voyou, or which we're translating as rogue, um, and uh, and. That's uh, something that I think we will probably come back to later. I'm not going to talk through those issues now, but I think later there will be a reason to address them at least a little bit. Um, but he does that in this case, especially to to show how that word is in the contemporary world, especially the world since about 1990, the coming down of the Berlin Wall and the end of the so-called Cold War, how that word, why you in French, and especially the English one, rogue, has been attached to the notion of a state, the rogue state that became a, a part of uh, democratic discourse, or I should say, it became part of the rhetoric of America, which also claims about itself that it is democracy. Uh, so America as democracy since the time of the Cold War 
has significantly used the rhetoric of rogue states to talk about what it portrays as its democratic mission in world political and military operations. And so that's that, that's really what he wants to get to. And so he says what he's really going to talk about is the epoch of rogue states. So he's going to talk about the, the kind of political world uh, we were in in 2002 when he wrote this, or when he, when he gave this talk, uh, uh, world that he was saying was really inaugurated around the time of the end, end of the Cold War, and the world that we may well still be in. But it's, you know, it's, it's this period that we're kind of dealing with where the thing that calls itself democracy is using this kind of language to, to talk about what it's doing. And he says that's what he wants to unravel that a bit. So he says he's going to do that in, uh, he's going to follow three threads to do that, to threads connected with the metaphor of ra- unraveling, I guess. Uh, the first one is going to be the a uh, little bit of exploration of this notion of democracy to come. And that goes on from pages, I think, 80 to 92. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the stuff that comes up basically from 80 to 86. Uh, but, I'll, but I'll come back to that. Uh, but that's going to be the first segment is 80 to 92. And that's almost the whole chapter. Uh, the second, th- uh, second thread is going to be the relationship between justice and law and, and also the closely connected issue of force. Uh, he's only going to talk about that briefly, I think, uh, pages 92 to 93. It's really about one page. Um, that's been a huge subject for him in other works, especially in this uh, essay called Force of Law. Uh, but And I will talk about that too. But it's, it only comes up very briefly here. And then the third thread is going to be this very notion of an epoch of rogue states. And he's going to introduce that at the end of this chapter again for a page or so. But that's really going to be the, the subject of the next chapter, chapter 9. Um, so that's the broad structure of this chapter. And now let me say one more thing about structure. In that, in that section where he's following out the first thread, right, in that section where he's talking about democracy to come, there's again a kind of a breakdown. The, uh, uh, there, are kind of, there are basically two things that happen. There's a first part where, as I've already indicated, he talks in a kind of negative way about his idea in relationship to uh, a Kantian idea of a, uh, re- a regulative ideal. And he, he says, you, you know, you might turn to the way Kant talks about a regulative ideal as, you know, one of the most philosophically powerful and profound attempts to grapple with that notion of what it is for something to be an ideal. And you remember, because I, I already said, we're in a way talking about what we might loosely call the ideal of democracy. Um, so he, he picks up on, Kant, on the Kantian approach to that as a way to talk about this. And he's, he, he then makes three points uh, about um, how what he wants to say about the notion of democracy to come uh, stands in relationship to that Kantian idea. And, and, you know, basically he's using that to say, I wouldn't want you to think of it this way. I wouldn't want you to think of it this way. Um, so, we'll, so and, and that's the stuff I'm really going to talk about. Um, but that takes us up to page 86. And that's, that's the first part of the first thread about democracy to come. And that's, as I said, kind of negatively, in a sense, distinguishing it from things he, he wouldn't want you to, to impute his notion. That's followed up then by a, a, a more positive discussion where he tries to say more directly what he means by this. And he says that's, gonna, that's got five, uh, five points of focus. Uh, so the overall essay is broken down into three parts, democracy to come, justice and law, epoch of rogue states. The first of those three parts itself has two parts, what I'm calling a kind of a negative part and a kind of a positive part. The negative part, which is the discussion of the relationship to the Kantian ideal, has three points. And then the positive part has five points. And uh, that's basically the structure of the whole thing. And I say that just because there there are two two threes in here, three threads and three points. There's five points, you know stuff all over the place you need to know where the thing you're reading fits into that overall structure so that's a a little introduction anyway so what i'm going to do now is um i'm going to say one i'm going to i'm just i'm going to start by just saying one thing about what comes up in that opening section when he's just introducing introducing the notion of the rogue state uh uh, but then my real goal is going to be just to talk through the issues that come up basically from pages 80 to 86 when he uh introduces um 
the theme of uh, the regulative ideal and and, and uh, talks about the three ways that he doesn't want you to think about it. Um, although even there, before we get directly to the regulative idea, there's something else he says at the beginning of that discussion of the of his first thread about the contemporary political world that we'll that we'll want to talk about a little bit. Anyway, okay, so that's where we're going to go. So from the basically. Uh, 80 to 86 is going to be our main focus, but before going to 80, I'm going to start on 79. Um, and so the the first point is just this. I want you just to think about a, a distinction he draws attention to. So he says on um, 79, you know, that word voyou in French, uh, sometimes uses a noun, sometimes uses an adjective, all these sorts of things. And he says, what's it applied to? And he says, uh, sometimes attached to a who and sometimes accorded to a what. Those are the first two lines on page 79. Uh, uh, and so I want you to think about that distinction between a who and a what. And it's a distinction he talks about frequently. He'll talk about it again in this chapter, and uh, but he talks about it quite a bit in other works too. Um, it's a very important distinction. Uh, it's a distinction in a way that uh, we were we've been grappling with this whole time, right? We, in our discussion of Dasein, we were talking really about what it is to be a who. And what's, the question is, what it is to be a subject, someone for whom experience is happening not just a what an object to whom things happen i guess um, but something someone for whom that's and you know that's what sartre calls a being for itself um, so that's that's really what we're after with the notion of a who uh, and you know we, we that, again that's what we were doing from the very beginning when we we're looking at that painting by manet and so on right we've been we've been trying to 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 emphasize the, the reality. So we've been doing a kind of ontology of that kind of being that is a who. That's been what we've been studying. Uh, and when we try to talk about that, you know, we distinguish that from basically a what. And that distinction is also the whole foundation of that notion of rights. You know, the idea of rights is that we're going to say, because you're a who, you have rights. You know, that's what you want to protect. You want to protect people who are who's. You want, you want to protect who's from being treated as mere what's. Right? That's what rights are, are, or human rights, you know, are about. So, um, so I want you to, to recognize that that language is a philosophical distinction that has been the core of everything we've been thinking about. And it's a political distinction that's at the heart of what we've been doing too. And, and indeed, that's a large part of why we're studying these things, these topics together. Um, you know, and again, let me just add one more thing. You know, Heidegger gave us a pretty rigorous study of what it is to be a who. He even had a chapter called that, right? The who of Dasein uh, was the, was basically the topic of chapter four of Division One, where he talked about the they. And so there, you know, what it is to be a they is, oh, sorry, what it is to be a who is, on the one hand, to be lost in the they, but on the other hand, also to have the possibility of authenticity. Uh, intimately related to the idea that to be a who is to be a, being characterized by the possibility of conscience, possibility of anxiety. Uh, all those sorts of things. It's a matter of having a world. That's really where we started. To to be a who is, is to be the kind of being that has a world. Um, so again, I say that just to 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 help you put together this little expression he uses on seventy nine with all the things we've been thinking about. And I want you just to to sort of put those things in place in your own thinking so that you kind of are are oriented towards this issue issue in a philosophically rich and meaningful way. Um, yeah, so let's say there is a good philosophical reason to make that distinction. I mean, you can think about that too. Maybe there isn't. You might, maybe you want to challenge this whole thing. It's fine, but let's 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 just accept that that there has been a good reason for wanting to think about who. Politically, you can ask, how is that distinction deployed? Well, that notion of rights uh, was supposed to be about the recognition of who's to use this kind of language. And then we can ask, well, who is recognized in the discourse of rights or indeed in the actual policies of carrying out rights? It's funny, in the discourse of rights, there we could raise some questions. You know, I, I told you the um, for the French Revolution, it's, the, the, the document was the uh, the rights of, uh, of man and citizen. Um, you know, in that language of man, l'homme in that case, and, and uh, but, you know, man in so much discourse... Uh, is pretty pronounced. Um, are women? Are women in there? And it, even in the UN's Declaration of Human Rights, you know, they they talk about, um, I th if I'm not mistaken, they talk about brotherhood. 
uh, which is one of the themes that that um, Derrida really focuses on the chapters we didn't read here, where he's engaging with uh, Jean Jean Luc Nancy. Uh, he's you know he's taking these French ideals of uh, liberty, fraternity, and uh, equality, and he's saying fraternity is that is that the word we really want to use for talking about this? In as much as there could be many other issues too, but at the very least, it's a man notion, not a woman notion. Um, so, so the discourse of rights um, has been linked with pretty s some 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 selective criteria for determining who uh, who is, and you know, one pretty obvious one is that historically it is it is accorded who status to men, and not so much to women. Uh, another pretty obvious one, going back to the themes about racism and colonialism and slavery and so on, right? Uh, politically, that very language of rights, and the, the, I should I should put maybe I should say this that very way of distinguishing between who and what has been used as a way to uh, exclude black people from the domain of rights and to treat black people as what's not as who's you know so the discourse of rights i mean this just picks up again on the themes we were dealing with before but i'll just say it again you know the discourse of rights is you know supposed to be liberatory right and yet or another way of saying that is the recognition of a who is supposed to be part of a of a liberatory uh process and practice and yet the the very way that distinction is then made the very the very practice of saying okay we're going to recognize who's is is um, is a matter of saying we're going to distinguish who's from what's and that means we're going to call a bunch of other people what's and we're not going to treat them very nicely right that's what that has in fact uh that's at least one side of what it has meant so so who is included in the who are women included are black people included though i name those two because those are, i would take to be profoundly obvious examples of unjust exclusion uh and ones that uh, no, yeah, of course, we, we still live in a world characterized by plenty of explicit racism and misogyny and all the rest. So there are lots of people for whom that recognition has not been obviously made. But at the level of ge general cultural recognition in our culture, th those two, those two are, you know, have sort of been decided, although there may be a lot of backpedaling south of the border right now. Um, but, you know, native peoples of North America, uh, that's a tougher one. You know, even people who uh, uh, would wouldn't dream of not acknowledging that um, black people and women are who's are people, uh, e even if in their explicit spoken utterance would say, "Oh, of course I recognize that the uh, indigenous peoples of North America are who's and rights-bearing individuals in the sense that we're thinking about in people's practices and maybe or in pe yeah in people's practices, in, but maybe even more in their sort of affect and, and general orientation is not so obvious that, that, that people do recognize that. It's a harder one to recognize. Maybe it's a harder one to recognize because the political stakes of recognizing it are, are going to be more painful. Uh, but that's, that's a, we can think about that another time. Um, all I'm trying to do is draw your attention to uh, the, that distinction and the way it functions in our lives, politically, but also emotionally, uh, uh, and, and to name some of the places it comes up. Okay, women, black people, uh, indigenous peoples of North America, let's say, or, or other colonized places. Um, what would be some other ones? Well, let's, let's well, two other ones, two other, two other familiar ones. Uh, what about prisoners? Again, once again, people would, of course, say, oh, yes, those are human beings who have committed crimes and are now in jail. But in our actual practices, uh, they're, they're, they're not accorded the same rights legally and in people's attitudes again it seems to me prisoners are often treated kind of as what's in the sense that we think once we've branded someone as a prisoner it's okay to do to them whatever we want we can be really mean to them we can you know lock them up in little cages we can subject them to various kinds of uh, chemical experimentation it, uh, you know it's just we can use them for work without paying them forced labor basically slavery it's pretty appalling what is done to those the massive numbers of people uh, themselves usually from you know other other oppressed groups but the massive number of incarcerated people in North America but you know that's that's another way that uh, uh, you know do certain things that are illegal and you turn into a what 
effectively. You lose your status as a who. Well, that's one more. What about what about um, people with, of diminished mental capacity? You know, are, uh, do we treat them as who's or again similar ways? Do we treat them as what's? Uh, again, so those those I'm I'm listing as I think sort of um, all kind of familiar examples of of things that are manifestly people, but we we don't uh, we don't automatically accord full who status to all the people. But what about some other things? You know, maybe this sounds like science fiction, but what about a Martian? You know, if, uh, uh, if somebody comes from another uh, planet. Um, Maybe that sounds like science fiction, but but maybe what that really just means is yeah something we haven't had to deal with yet. Uh, maybe that's the democracy to come, right? Just to, to use a version of that expression, you know, what's what's going to happen when we engage with uh, life forms, if if that's the right word to use, f from another planet, and they're not exactly the same as us. Are they going to be who's? But we don't even have to go to Mars. Well, what about what about? Uh, other things that that challenge these boundaries a bit. What about chimpanzees? Chimpanzees use language. They have deep affectionate bonds, uh, deep emotions, anxiety. Um, uh, you know, you look at the treatment of of chimpanzees who have been taught language and so on, and what's happened to them. You know, when funding runs out and whatever, it's it's, it's not nice. Um, there again, it seems like you know all the primates like. Whew, should you accord them a who status or, or not? Uh, it seems like there's the pretty pretty strong candidates for who, uh, and yet we don't particularly extend a lot of rights to them. At the very least, we throw them all in prison in zoos. Even primates, uh, maybe that's, they, you know, some of them learn language. Maybe that's too obvious. What about ones that are a little farther away? What about dogs? What about the rest of animal, uh, the animal kingdom? Like, should there be rights for animals? Are, are they not who's? You know what? You go back to being in time. What does it take to be a who? Well, at some level, you know, you got to have a world. But Heidegger himself uh, strongly studied the the world of animals. Um, he he said, you know, if you compare the world of animals, you know, so what is the reason? Why do we distinguish between what we would call animals and what we call people? Well, because the things we call animals uh, have a world, but compared to the dimensions of the human world, that world seems impoverished. You know. Uh, so he calls them poor in world, but but should we be making that comparison? Does, is it is it, it? Yes, this is what our world is like. They have a different kind of world. Should we say that they are in saying poor in world that can make it sound like oh they're deficient versions of humans? Are they poor in world, which is to say they should be compared to us and in light of that seen as impoverished, or should we just say maybe they're different in world, uh, different kind of who? Um, but anyway, but there's there's animals. You might think about that. Are they who's or what's? But may, but whoa, let's go a little further. What about the whole of nature? Should nature be on the what side or should it be on the who side? Um, now, if I talk about nature as a who, you know, well, first of all, what is nature? It's like it's the self-occurring realm that is the generative matrix for all of us. Right? It's the very source of life. It is life, right? So should we think of that as a who? You might say, oh, well, if you call that a who, you're anthropomorphizing nature. Maybe, but but probably you could really only use that word anthropomorphizing nature if, again, I started off with the sense that the anthropos, the human being, was what a who is, and then I was just, I was taking that notion and attributing it to nature. But But maybe I could think of nature as a who without anthropomorphizing it. You know, maybe... On the contrary, it's the very notion of who that needs a little bit of redefining, and and reflections on nature might illuminate that. Maybe he, maybe nature shows us something about what it is to be a who, and maybe the anthropos isn't the only or even the paradigm version of that, right? Um, so we could explore that further. I'm not going to explore it further here. All I wanted to do was by quickly talking through some of those domains to get you to think a little bit about what's at stake in that distinction of who and what. You know, on the one hand, that's an that's a investigation worthy of philosophical reflection. And the whole premise of our study has been that you got to make that distinction, and it's a very important one. You, the recognition of who is, is crucial. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make beyond that is that uh, philosophically, yeah, that might be so, but politically, that distinction is wielded in a way that, on the one hand, claims to be 
and no doubt in some ways rightly claims to be drawing on that important recognition for liberatory reasons. But at the same time, in doing that, it, it will, it will draw, draw a distinct, distinction. And that distinction is then used for exclusionary reasons, which turn out to be kind of oppressive. You know, we've already recognized pretty dramatically, uh, presumably, the uh, oppressive exclusionary uh, history of the treatment of women and, and black people. Uh, but, you know, I've named a few other things here to suggest that maybe maybe we, that thinking needs to be pushed a little bit farther. Um, uh, and, and indeed, that seeing that political issue then sort of reattunes you to that philosophical issue and, and, and gets you to think about what, what philosophically is at stake in that. So I'm not by any means trying to deny uh, the philosophical importance of that. What I am, I guess, trying to note philosophically is that um, even if that distinction is right, it's not unambiguously obvious how or where it is to be drawn. That's all. Um, anyway, so that was just a little uh, preliminary reflection on that one line from page 79. Um, I'm not going to turn around and take it up again directly, but, but I wanted you to be thinking about that because it is in the background of a lot of things Derrida is going to say. I'm going to stop here for the moment. And then I'm going to come back and give you the main discussion of uh, pages 80 to 86 uh, on the, his, this notion of the ideal or the regulative ideal in the Kantian sense.